Christ is risen. He is risen and may we not forget. These are great days. We give thanks for a chance to gather together on a beautiful day. Can you praise God enough for what we uh, have in store for us later this afternoon? And uh, I want to share, you know, no matter what's going on in your world, in your life, in your circumstances, uh, we pray that today's message as we continue our walk through uh, 1 John as an eyewitness to the resurrection that John was, but also writing this, this epistle to encourage uh, fellow believers and what it means to live out this resurrection reality in these important days. May God meet you right where you are today as we continue with complete joy, a series on 1 John part two today. Glad you're here. A um, couple things to share before we get started. Next weekend, what's happening next weekend? And Anybody know? We are welcoming a new pastor, right? Yeah, Pastor Tyler Cronkright. It will be his first weekend officially uh, around here. Um, coming up, he'll be preaching next weekend, but also on Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m., uh, will be his official celebration of his installation. Uh, that afternoon, good, I, I want to encourage you, make that a priority to be there as well, to welcome the Cronkites with open arms. I would add too, since he's preaching in the morning uh, and on Saturday, if you come to worship before that, just be nice to him because he won't officially be installed then, he could change his mind, right? So um, just keep that in mind next week. And I, I, oh man, we, we are so pumped uh, to welcome him uh, as part of the team here. Um, I want to add to this as well, a couple opportunities uh, in the coming weeks to make a difference in Jesus' name and serve, roll up our, see- our sleeves and, and get our hands dirty serving. One of them comes up on the 27th, April 27th. I don't know if we have that slide. Here it is. Um, spring spruce up here on our St. John campus. Kind of, uh, if you love doing landscaping and, and fall clean or spring cleanup kind of stuff, we'll be doing that together. Lots of different projects, different skill levels. Great family event day, uh, 9 to 2 p.m. Food will be included. Um, just want let us know you're coming, register ahead of time so we can plan for that. Uh, it should be a fun day, too. May God give us a great weather day. We're praying on that. So that's the 27th. Uh, looking a little further ahead, May 4th, uh, we have a, a mission partner makeover day. We're going to St. Paul in Pontiac, one of our primary mission partner, partners, and uh, spending some time doing a similar thing over there, doing fix-up jobs as well as... Uh, uh, sp- uh, spring cleanup there too, and uh, encourage you make that a priority. A great community day as well coming up, and get that on your calendar. Uh, I think that's by way of announcements all I've got for you. Other than it is good to be with you today as we continue that Easter celebration of resurrection joy. Let's stand as God's people say hello to somebody near you, welcome them, and we'll start with our opening hymn in just a minute. <laughs>
And as God's people, on this side of an empty tomb, we call upon the one who has called us as his own in joy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. And Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made And Jesus told them, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. And I want to invite you now to humble yourself in God's presence this morning as we kneel or sit at this time, going before Him in confession. And let us then together confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God. And sisters and brothers, what good news it is today. It's news of joy. That our God knows what we've confessed. He knows our need, our broken reality of sin and death. And he does something about it. It's why Jesus came into this fallen world to lay down his life purposely in our place. Going the way of death. Dying on that cross. But coming to full life again in the resurrection. Empty tomb. That reminds you today, you are loved, you are forgiven, you are set free in life and joy in your Savior Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing. Lord be with you. We pray. Lord Jesus, teach us and remind us again not to be deceived by this world, 
but rather to draw our hearts to the joy that is true joy, joy that's found in abiding in you as our Savior and Lord in your presence here today. So may we now, as we open that word, abide there. May you speak to us and fill us with reminders of what that gift gives and the joy that exceeds anything we could imagine. And in your presence, we give you thanks as you live, Jesus, with the Father and the Spirit as one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I do invite you now to be seated as we open God's Word. Our epistle reading this morning comes from 1 John, the second chapter, beginning with the 12th verse. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is, is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, now it is the last hour, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all the knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he do, who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If that what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everything, everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Alleluia. I invite you to stand. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, 
peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they, had, they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. Lord And together we profess our faith, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. Please be seated as we continue by singing our hymn of the day.
of feels like we need a Christ is risen. Jesus Just saying. Kind of does, doesn't it? I want to write uh, and throw a, a verse up here for you. I love this verse. Reflected on it a bit with Pastor Steve last week. It comes in chapter 1 of 1 John. Chapter 1, verse 4. Read it with me. We write this to make your joy complete. What John is getting at as an eyewitness to the resurrection. Now keep in mind he was there through the crucifixion. He was there in Gethsemane when Jesus was arrested and betrayed. The disciples, they all fled. And then we find that moment at the foot of the cross. There's Mary saying, uh, or there's Jesus saying to his mother, behold your son and behold your mother to John who's there at the foot of the cross with his mom Mary. And, and then you get to the resurrection day, right? And John gives us that wonderful detail that he is a much better and faster runner than his friend Peter, right? He beats him to the tomb. We also get a glimpse as John later is there and when Peter is reinstated after that fish, fishing episode that's coming up here. And, and think about this. John was there. He experienced it. He lived it. He realized, you know, this resurrection thing is not just, a, oh, that's an interesting day to celebrate. No, this, this changes life as we know it. It changes our reality and how we see the world around us as we're going to be reminded even further today as we get into chapter 2 a little bit. But as Pastor Steve reminded us last week, you know, we get into this, this book of an eyewitness named John and, and a book that speaks so much about wanting our joy to be complete. And how is that joy manifested in our lives? It comes by way of realizing the joy that comes by... Uh, comprehending the love God has for us as people who often are deceived. Pastor Steve talked about a green screen, and uh, let us not be deceived. You can tell sometimes when it's not real, right? And let's not also deceive ourselves into thinking we don't need this gospel truth in our lives as broken, sin sinful people. We're in need of it every day, and relishing in that joy that God gives and the love of God, but also the joy that comes in then loving other people and, and expressing that love. And we're going to hear more about that in the coming days, and especially next weekend as Pastor Tyler will be sharing a message about that. And, and uh, speaking of Pastor Tyler and joy, uh, I think it's important that I, I put a picture up here for you. Um, if you don't know this, Pastor Tyler is my only convert to becoming a Minnesota Viking fan in 26 years of ministry. And so there is great joy, not only in that fact, but also that God has brought him onto our team. Imagine how obnoxious it's about to get during football season. Um, talk about joy. Hopeful joy, sometimes in the midst of sorrow. Okay, moving on. Let's get into this. You know, a Paul, I'm sorry, John goes on in, in chapter 2 here. And, and there's this kind of fatherly moment where he's addressing children, I tell you, right? Remember, you're forgiven. And he's, he's given them these reminders of why there's reason for joy. And fathers, he encourages the fathers, he encourages the children, he encourages the youth. He's, he's, he's encouraging all of us. And in this wisdom that God has given him as an eyewitness, where does true joy come from? I would guess if I ask you this question right now, where does true joy come from for you? You might come up with a few ideas. Golf course, Dan Gar, all right? Um, watching the masters today, there's some joy there, right? Um, how about maybe for you, other hobbies in your life, maybe watching the Red Wings win last night in overtime. Maybe for you, what brings you joy is your family, or maybe you're blessed with grandkids, or maybe what brings you joy is... Um, a beautiful sunny day and to go outside today. You know, there's a lot of things maybe we can list in that category of this brings me joy. I would guess, though, if I said, name the things in your life that rob you of joy, that steal joy, that take away joy, my guess is your list would be longer, wouldn't it? Sometimes it's easier to think of things that bring us or steal joy out of our lives, especially if we're in the throes of hardship or difficulty or circumstances that are not what we want. What robs you of joy? I find it interesting that John would write to us as he writes to the churches and believers of that day and he reminds them of things that rob them of joy and what's fascinating is they wouldn't show up in most people's categories of joy robbers because they're so deceptive in how they rob us of joy we don't often realize it. 
In fact, they might even show up in our categories of things that bring us joy. And what John is getting at is don't be deceived. It's not real. Here's what he says as we get to verses 15 and 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. For anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I'm positive for a minute. This is a little bit of sobering reality here. Okay, so John is saying if I'm infatuated or I love the world, which let's be honest, every message we see on TV, every message we see on social media, every message often we, we pick up in just about every contest text is the fact that life here is all about finding ways to be in love with this world. And John is saying if you are in love with it, you and the Father have nothing in common. You, you, there's a disconnect between you and your relationship with God. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Let's pull this apart a bit. The desires of the flesh, a lot of times we, we connect that with sexual desires or lustful desires, things of that sort, and, and certainly uh, the Apostle Paul in particular speaks a lot about that in the New Testament, and, and it, it can often become this, this love or this infatuation, this dopamine reality that we just can't seem to get enough of. And, and our culture is saturated by it and, and, and loves it. Do you love it? Does it stir in you a love? Maybe it's a question for us today. Is it a joy for us? A pseudo joy? Desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and pride of life. And, and a lot of scholars have talked about the, the Greek here and what he's talking about, the desires of the eyes and, and, and this, this pride of life. And, and many scholars believe what he's getting at, and I'll just read this. I found this kind of a fascinating realization of what, what's going on here. He says, these lines refer to boasting about one's material possessions or wealth or showing off one's possessions, boasting of one's social status or lifestyle. In this case, the material security of one's life and possessions produces a boastful over overconfidence. This understanding better fits the context here. The, the focus is on people who operate purely on a human level and have no spiritual dimension to the existence. This is the person who loves the world, whose affections are all centered on the world, who has no love for God or spiritual things. Or as John writes, the love of the Father is not in him. The arrogance produced by Material possessions, the, the person who thinks he has enough wealth and property pr to protect himself and ensure his security has no need for God or anything outside of himself. Oof. <laughs> Those are hard words to read. You're like, oh, I'm glad I don't struggle with that. <laughs> really? <laughs> See, this is the problem is deception. Uh, the problem with the world is it looks really normal to be focused on things like that. And you're to say, well, that's not true for me because I, I don't have a lot of material wealth. And, and the problem is we forget because we're so saturated with wealth and materialism, we forget that it's everywhere. And it drives us pretty much every day as Americans. It just does because we're so incredibly blessed to live where we live and a time in which we live. No matter what everybody tells you, no matter how many times people complain, we are still the wealthiest nation that has ever existed in the history of the world. We're swimming in it. Everywhere we look, we are just surrounded by wealth and materialism. And the message is, get more stuff, have more things, get that next gadget, get this next outfit, take on this new hobby, get that new bike, that was for me, get, yeah, and, and then you will find joy, right? And Paul says, and the world is passing away along with its desires. It's all temporary. Um, when's the last time you attended a funeral where there was a U-Haul trailer being hauled behind it? You can't take it with you. So the question is, what is all this stuff 
all this consumption, all of this want, all this desire, what's, what's it all about? And what do we do with it? And what's it doing to us? Remember when I, I was studying to be a pastor and I was home, my home congregation in Minnesota, and I was listening to a message by my pastor, Pastor Metzger, and I remember him sharing this story of this guy that was really just overwhelmed uh, overwhelmed by his situation, scared that um, all of his investments were going to tank. He was afraid of his financial well-being. He was afraid of somebody breaking into his house and stealing things. He was just consumed with uh, anxiety and fear. And he went to, uh, to see a, a spiritual counselor. And, and as he's there, the counselor says, hey, I want you to, after he shared all this, so I'd like you to stand up. I want you to go over to the window and look out and tell me what you see. And he walks over to the window, kind of thinking, this is silly. He's like, I don't know what you want me to tell you. I see a beautiful sunny day. I, I see the park across the street. I see children playing. I see a, a mom walking with a stroller. I, I see a dad playing with his kids. I see others, uh, young people having fun, playing a game. I uh, said, good. I, now I want you to go across my office and go look through that wind, or through that, that into that mirror, and, and so he did. He went up and he had a, a, a mirror on the wall, and he just stared at it, like thinking, "This is really silly, even more silly." Um, I don't know what you want to tell you. I, I see myself. And his counselor said, "Isn't it interesting? Both involve looking through a pane of glass, and yet one has expensive silver coating the backside, and, and how that enables you now to only see yourself." He says, now listen to what I have to say next. And he began to counsel me. He said, you are so consumed with your wealth that it's given you the focus only on yourself. You know, so much for joy, right? Often when we become so consumed with materialism, it does. It robs us of joy because what it inserts is a fear of losing it or fear of not having enough or fear of an absolute drivenness to get more of it because it's never, ever, 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 ever enough. So is John suggesting then that having material wealth is a sin? Or is it more about what we do with it and what our focus is? I think you answered that one right. It's the latter. It's like, what do we do with it? How do we live in this world as people of the resurrection whose eyes and hearts and lives are focused on eternity? What does it mean to honor God with the days we are given and to be people who cannot help but speak about what we have seen and what we have heard? How do we honor God with what we've been given? Pondering this a little bit, when I was growing up, I remember my dad. Think of two like John saying, fathers. Remember your sins are forgiven, fathers and, and children. Remember you are loved by Jesus and how John's imparting this wisdom. My dad's named John. I love this. And my dad, John, when I was a kid, we were on our way to church one Sunday, which we did every week. We were late, and we were in the car as a family, and my mom said, did you bring the offering envelope? And my dad says, oh, you know what? I, I left it on the, on the desk. And he said, hey, Mark, would you run inside and go get it? And I, I ran into the house upstairs to where the office was, the desk office, and, and uh, there's the checkbook with the check written out to St. Paul Lutheran Church, and I couldn't believe how many zeros were behind that number. And I tore it out, almost shaking, and I put it in the envelope knowing they were waiting for me, but I looked at it and I'm like, I can't believe this. And I went back down into the car, they handed it to my mom, they're like, thank you, and we get to church, and family's going in, and my, my dad held back and he said, did you see how much it was? I said, I did. I said, Dad, that's a lot of money. And he says, Mark, I want you to remember something. You can never outgive God. And he says, I've been reminded of this my entire life. As God has blessed me to be a blessing, you can never outgive God. Don't forget that. Because it, it all is temporary. And I remember that day. My dad wasn't the most spiritual guy, but I'll tell you, there were moments where I'm like, the Lord was working on his heart and reminding me and teaching me things that I, I couldn't ever forget. You can't outgive God. I remember Shane and I later on when, when I became a pastor, my first call, we were invited to a, a couple's house. They were nearing retirement and they had had a party with their, their kids and invited us to be part of it and it was a celebration moment and, and uh, they did a toast uh, and I thought we were just kind of getting together and, and invited to be part of the family. It was more than that. They said, 
we wanted to tell you why we're having this party. And, and these were just incredible people where the gospel just oozed out of their life in every way. And I just remember their witness for Jesus. And uh, in this moment, very humbly, they said, and with tears in their eyes, they said, we've been praying for this night uh, our entire marriage. And I think they'd been married close to 40 years at that point. And it's, we've been praying for this time to celebrate with our family the fact that we just paid off our mortgage. And I'm thinking, cool, that's great. That's not, where it, that's not what it was about, though. We just paid off the mortgage, and when we first got married and bought a house, our goal was, on top of our ongoing tithing, that the day would come when we would pay off our mortgage, and we would add that on top of our ongoing giving to the Lord to honor him for his many blessings. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm pinching Shane's hand underneath the table. I'm like, oh, that's an amazing goal. And, and I felt about this big, like, I, but you could feel the joy of that announcement. It wasn't bragging. It, it wasn't an attention. No, it was about we are seeing God answer a prayer, and we can't wait to act on something he's put on our heart, to be that generous. I'd suggest to you that that is how we manage wealth and materialism in a way that honors God, in a way that we walk in this world and not get consumed by it. Where we open our hands and say, Lord, what's it look like for me to be more generous with what you've blessed me with? Rather than being caught up in this deception that it's all about me. And it's all about me getting more stuff and me being happier. And you know what? It's fleeting. And I guarantee you it doesn't bring joy. At least not lasting joy. It might bring pseudo joy. And so Paul says it. I'm sorry, John says it, right? Abide. Love this, how this section ends. We read this, you know, do not love the world or things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, of pride of life, it's not of, from the Father. But you go on there and he says, the world's passing away. It's temporary. As Paul would write it, God loves a joyful giver, cheerful. We just, we say, Lord, it, it's all yours anyway. And he says, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I love that word abide, right? And, and the question is, how do we abide? Is he saying here, do this, and then God will reward you with this? No, no, that's out of context. That's not at all what he's saying. Rather, it's abiding in what God has already done for you. It's abiding in why Jesus came into this world to die in your place. It's abiding in what God has done on this side of an empty tomb to bring joy and peace in a relationship with him that opens our eyes that what it's all about is what is ahead into eternity. And we live each day today abiding in his presence. Notice what he goes on to say after this in terms of abiding. I love these words. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the, in the Father. And this is the promise that he has made to us. Eternal life. What's the promise he's made to us? Eternal life. Just making sure you're listening, right? I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So he's, we read this earlier Antichrists and many antichrists have come claiming Jesus isn't God, claiming that the faith isn't really what everybody says it is, and creating doubt and, and discouragement and leading people away from the gospel. And John's saying, like, I've written to you about those who've tried to deceive you. Don't, don't get caught up in the lies, in the deception of this world. But then he goes on, he says, But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. Just as it has taught you, abide in him, and now little children, abide in him. How many times can he say abide, right? Do you think he's trying to help us to remember something that's important, right? Abide, abide, abide. The one who abides in you through this anointing. What's the anointing he's talking about? When were you anointed with the Holy Spirit as a child of God? In your baptism. Um, if you're an adult, Believer that came to faith first and then was baptized, so guess what? The Word of God brought the Holy Spirit's anointing in your life, and God only further affirmed and confirmed that in your baptism. If you were baptized as a baby, God brought the anointing of the Spirit 
through that means of grace of your baptism, working again through the Word of God, the powerful Word of God, anointing, where God came to abide His presence in your life. And a God who then invites us to continue to abide in Him. So what's that look like for us as resurrection people of joy? To abide in Jesus. I'll give you an example of this. So my dad, John, taught me this as well. We, uh, I was 12 years old, and I was finally old enough. He took me on my first ever uh, out-of-the-area hunting trip. And we got all geared up and got the truck loaded up and, and made our way up north to Thief River Falls, and uh, we were going goose hunting. And, and the night before we were, the hunt was going to begin, we went out to the field where we'd hunt. There were these uh, blinds in the middle of the field made out of hay bales, and and as we came over the hill that night, as the sun was about to set, I'm telling you, I've never seen so many geese. There were thousands, hundreds, thousands of geese covering the field, this cornfield that had been harvested, and uh, they were just trying to find extra corn. They were just there feeding, and I, look, I said to my dad, like, this is going to be easy, right? I, all these geese. And so the next day, we get up before the sun rises. It's freezing, and we go have breakfast. We get out there to the blind be- before the sun comes up. Our guide that was with us went out there and put out the decoys. These are the fake, deceptive geese that aren't real, right, to, to surprise or, or pretend to, and, and lure the other geese in. And we'd been practicing our goose calls, you know, with the goose calls and, and doing that. And I won't demonstrate with my, my hand because that would be silly. But um, I was ready. And uh, the sun started to come up. And in the distance, you could hear the geese honking. And I, so we started honking and, and waiting for the geese to come. And, and the first half hour, I'm like, they got to come any minute now. And they didn't come. And an hour, two hours, three hours, still not coming. Could hear them in the distance, though. And I'm like, come on, they got to come. Where are the geese? And that whole day, not one goose flew in. Next day, I'm like, they got to get better than this. They never came. Three days went by, not one goose flew over our blinds or got lured in by the fake geese or our fake goose calls. They wouldn't buy it. And I remember looking out several hundred yards away over a river, there was a a wildlife refuge and there were thousands and thousands of geese. That's the voices we were hearing of the geese. It was like they were mocking us from a distance, right? Right? And I remember dad, my dad saying, oh, if we would be as smart as geese. And I would say, if, as only as a pastor, if only we would be as smart as geese, right? A God who reminds us today through his word, we are, filled in a, we are surrounded in this world with deception, things that are not what they seem. And the calls of darkness and the call of what seems to be light that isn't light, the things that seem so promising, and yet they're a promise that is not fulfilled in this world. And yet a God who says, abide in me. And how do we abide there? We abide with him in moments like this where we say, worship means something. I meet Jesus there and Jesus meets me with his abiding presence in my life, the one who has called me by name. A God who reminds me in his word as I study it, as I gather in community with others to study it, realize uh, this is not easy to do life alone in a world that is so deceptive that I need others to continue to remind me of God's presence in my life. How does God meet us? He meets us through the sacrament when we receive the Lord's Supper, his body and his blood that strengthens our faith with his abiding presence right here. And guess what? He opens our eyes to see things that are temporary and discern better in this world what is not real. But he opens our eyes to what is and that which is eternal. And the joy that only our Savior Jesus brings on the other side of an empty tomb, we praise God today. Christ is risen. And we pray. Lord Jesus, teach us to abide in you. You're right in your word that we might have complete joy, and may that joy be complete among us today in this messed up world that is so deceptive and so empty. Lord, bring true joy, not be sucked dry of joy, but rather be filled with joy in your presence through your word here today and every day to celebrate life in you and be people who cannot help but speak about what we have seen and what we have heard, the joy that changes everything as we abide in you so you invite others to abide as well. 
Give you thanks today, Jesus, in joy. As you live, so we live, now and always. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to continue in prayer as we lift up others that are going through difficulty and as well as others that are celebrating this weekend. Uh, and, and I invite you to bow your heads as we do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we give you thanks for your presence, your abiding presence in our lives and a perspective that is eternal that you build in us. And Lord, teach us what it means to live lives that share that joy along the way, to be more generous, to be more loving, to be more, uh, be more encouraging as you continue to encourage us and show us the generosity of your grace poured out on us in our Savior. Lord, thank you for that today. And we pray that you would surround those that are going through difficult times, different walks of, of healing that are needed. And, and among them, we pray this weekend for Ashley Lynn, the daughter of Susan Williams. Uh, we pray continued recovery for Dave Peck and follow up to a heart procedure this week. Lord, we pray for Mary McCollman as uh, chemotherapy treatments have begun again. For Laura Tom, uh, recovering from cancer surgery. For Rick Webster, the son-in-law of Dale and Susan McCorman. For Arnie Schilke, recovering after a hospital stay. We lift up Ashley as well as she sorts through some, some struggles in her life. And others, Lord, that need that encouragement of your presence here today as you abide with them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray for families that uh, are, are walking that path of grieving a loved one in these days. And among them, we pray for the family of Brian Castigan, the cousin of Elizabeth Olson. Uh, we pray for the family of John Mallon, the father of Annie Schramm and the Schramm family. We pray as well for the, uh, the family of Roy Jewell, who passed away just last night, and especially lifting up his family and Kathy Evans as a daughter as she grieves in this time. Comfort them. And all of them, we pray, Jesus, as a Savior who conquers death and gives victory in the name of life over death. And we praise you for that resurrection reality in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray for uh, our church and our ministry and school in these days, as well as uh, the nomination process for upcoming leaders in, in our vestry and our elders and our, our foundation. And uh, Lord, pray for those that are discerning uh, your will uh, in whether or not to keep their name into the mix as we approach our congregation meeting in, uh, in the coming month. And Lord, we pray uh, for your guidance in that as we give thanks, Lord, for all that you're doing among us as we continue to grow together and, and serve together and see you do what only you can do, Lord Jesus, uh, to impact a community and impact a world uh, through us. Thank you for it, Jesus. May we remain faithful in these days. We, we pray too for our eighth graders as they gear up to head off to Washington, D.C. Uh, for their class trip this week. Keep them safe along the way, as well as an incredible experience uh, to learn more about your blessing over our country, uh, but also their part in it. Uh, we pray that. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, thank you for opportunities to make a difference in your name. Upcoming serve events, whether the, the spring spruce up on our campus, whether it is the upcoming mission makeover in, in Pontiac. Lord, bless our hands as we serve together in community and celebrating all your blessings and opportunities to share it beyond us. We pray it. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Thank you today, Lord Jesus. Uh, in a little bit, as uh, Roman Joseph Williams will receive the washing of the water and the word and the Spirit's anointing in his baptism, as we give thanks with his mom and dad, Kristen and Kevin, this weekend and ongoing walking in faith together. Lord, we pray for Bob and Ann Danielson celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary and uh, the witness of love and, 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 and service and faithfulness to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your faithfulness to them. We pray for Brian Beckett today and giving you thanks for our brother's celebration of his 40th birthday today. And Lord, thank you for Brian and the blessing that he is as part of our St. John family as well. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we lift up our community, nation, our world leaders, our, our national leaders, our community leaders, and, and we lift up as well, especially on this weekend, and uh, just continuing escalation of conflict, and uh, including yesterday's attack by Iran on Israel. And uh, Lord Jesus, we pray. Um, this world is so broken and so hurting and so messed up, and, and conflict and 
We pray for discernment uh, for leaders, and we pray for safety over those who serve in military. We, ser- we pray, Lord Jesus, um, your kingdom come, because you remind us your kingdom is not of this world, and really that's what our longing is, is for a kingdom beyond what we see. And so may our hearts and our eyes be fixed there as a Savior who also teaches us to pray together. Our Father, who art in do invite you now to stand as, as God's people as we go out in that joy that only our God can, can give as God opens our eyes with greater discernment this week as we serve and, and live out that joy in the gift of he who has come for us as our Savior and Lord resurrected. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you and lift, as he lifts his, his countenance upon you and gives you his peace now and always. Amen. Yeah, and as we go out, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Remain standing for our closing hymn.